chapter twenty six of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in the land of the houses we are now traveling in northern nigeria through the lands of the houses nigeria is a vast country belonging to great britain comprising a large part of the basin of the river niger it is several hundred miles wide and extends from the gulf of guinea to the sahara it has altogether about twenty five million inhabitants of whom more than fifteen million speak the hausa language but who are the hausas we ask they are black people who for ages have been among the most civilized and most powerful of the africans they have a tradition that their ancestors came from arabia to the sudan many hundred years ago and settled some distance north of where the city of kano is now they founded kano more than five hundred years before columbus started on his voyage of discovery and built up here a great empire which was half as large as the continent of europe later on their empire was broken up into small kingdoms and to-day the same country is composed of many kingdoms some of the rulers paying tribute to the kings of sokoto or gondo we stop at house of villages on our way to kana the people are as black as any we have seen but their lips are not so thick as those of the negroes they are a mixture of the hamitic branch of the white race and the negro and are far more intelligent and of a higher degree of civilization than the pure negroes of the coast the houses dress becomingly both men and women wear clothes of native cotton dyed blue or scarlet and sometimes embroidered in beautiful patterns the ordinary costume is a loose gown which has wide flaps covering the arms and a pair of baggy trousers below it there is a great pocket at the front of the gown in which all sorts of things are carried and as many of the houses are somewhat light-fingered we have to watch them while they call upon us that our valuables may not find their way into one of these pockets the houses wear enormous hats they have boots and shoes but they seldom use them except when in town the children go scantily clad and babies are often naked the little ones are carried by their mothers tied to their backs and we frequently see women binding wheat or hoeing the garden with babies slung to their backs the larger house of villages have walls about them for defence the dwellings are odd most of them being built almost entirely of mud we know why when we remember that the white ant will eat any timber which is put into a building very few of the houses are of more than one story there is but little furniture a bedstead made of reeds about a foot and a half high serves as a seat during the day and as a sleeping place at night in some cases the bedstead is made of mud with a hollow place under it in which a fire can be lighted such bedsteads are not strong and although we like the warmth we should fear that the bed might give way and we drop through into the fire we find the houses very polite they make us at home in their villages and often send a guide with us to the next town such a man usually carries a drum to give the people the news of our coming the drum serves as the telegraph instrument of this part of the world when villages are close together messages can be sent from one town to another by tapping on the drum in a certain way and our drummers are thus able to let the people know who we are and how to receive us long before we get there ourselves as we near kano we meet many hausa soldiers and now and then a long-gowned priest in a turban these people are mostly mohammedans and we see them praying with their faces toward the east and learn that they even make pilgrimages to mecca among the most bigoted are those of the race known as fulas who are taller and have lighter skins than the houses themselves they scowl at us as we pass by for they do not like christians these people believe in charms and some of the fulas are thought to be so holy that they can write charms which will prevent disease make one rich or cause his sweetheart to love him the charm is first written in ink on a flat piece of wood it is then scoured off and the wash water is drunk by the person who wants to benefit by the charm they are also skilled in making poisons and we are warned we must be careful what we eat 
as we go through the country the houses have excellent food they are good farmers we pass fields of guinea corn maize wheat and rice they raise quantities of millet and also peas beans sweet potatoes and onions they have bananas oranges mangoes and other fruits some of them have large herds and flocks and so many bees that their country is really a land of milk and honey they fry sweet potatoes in palm oil and roast yams over the fire they make cakes of flour mixed with red pepper and a porridge of guinea corn so seasoned with pepper that it almost burns one's mouth we have plenty of chickens and ducks and occasionally some beef mutton or goat's flesh the houses eat the locusts which now and then come in swarms over the country darkening the face of the sky they catch locusts with nets and roast them we spend some time in kano it is perhaps the largest city in central africa it has about a hundred thousand people and is surrounded by walls fifteen miles in circumference the land for miles about is well cultivated and there are many little gardens inside the walls the city has thirteen gates and also a water gate to let out the floods much of kano is low and swampy and a sheet of water near the centre divides the city into two parts on one side of the water the richer houses and most of the arabs live and on the other side are the poorer people kano is made up of a variety of low buildings most of the houses are of mud and many are surrounded by walls one wall often encloses several houses some parts of the town are given up to manufacturers the people doing the work at their homes here they are weaving the cloth in long narrow strips beautifully dyed so famous throughout central africa here they are sewing saddles and leather goods and there making great hats of straw while in a house farther on a blacksmith is pounding out a spear or a sword the most interesting place in the city is the market which lies close to the lake it is said to be the largest market in africa and it is estimated that there are often thirty thousand people buying and selling here at one time there has been a market on this spot for many centuries and a thousand years ago the people were making goods in this town the crowd in the market is from all the regions about there are half-naked black-skinned men with negro features there are fair-skinned warriors from the desert with veils over their faces and long-gowned arabs in turbans the market stalls are rude sheds of leaves and mud or mere mats or cloths hung up to shield the sellers and buyers from the rays of the sun at other places the dealers have spread their stuff in the ground and are selling out in the open every kind of goods has its own quarter here they are peddling fuel the wood is tied up in bundles and it is brought in from the country on the heads of slaves over there nothing but cloth is sold the goods are of bright colors and the most beautiful of them were made by the houses other cloths from europe have been brought across the sahara on camels we stroll through the leather market pricing the strange-looking shoes and slippers and the boots of red and yellow leather turned up at the toes there are leather pillows and soft leather cases for books most of the house books are unbound and these cases are somewhat like satchels we go to the pottery stores where cooking utensils made of clay are sold and then to the ironmongers to buy a spear a sword and other trinkets we stop at the sweetmeat stands to taste a mixture of honey and nuts fried in oil and then go on to a stall where the merchants are selling sugar and salt to the children we find that they charge quite as much for the salt as the sugar and that the children seem quite as glad to eat one as the other the grain and vegetable markets are interesting we see millet rice barley and different kinds of corn there are also pumpkins peanuts onions yams and sweet potatoes fresh and sour milk butter and cheese we hear a great squawking buying and braying and pass on to the section devoted to the fowls goats sheep cattle horses and donkeys we can buy a good riding pony for about five hundred thousand cowries and a fine saddle is worth more than its weight in these shells among other strange things in the market are cola nuts used as a stimulant and for medicine and antimony with which the women dye their eyelids to make them more beautiful 
we spend some time going from section to section watching market chiefs collect the taxes of the merchants according to the places they have and the amount of their sales everything is carefully ordered and we feel quite as safe as in our markets at home end of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the upper niger and jenna we are travelling this morning up the great river niger toward timbuktu the chief trading centre of the french soudan we left kano some weeks ago and made our way to sokoto werno and gondo smaller cities farther westward governed by fulahs having people not unlike the houses from there we came to the niger one of the chief rivers of the world and are now afloat upon it the niger is as long as the mississippi proper it is surpassed only by the congo and the nile among the rivers of africa and it has a basin almost one-third as large as the united states the river rises on the western side of the kong plateau not far from the sea and flows clear across the sudan in a northeasterly direction to the sahara it skirts the desert for some distance and then turns to the southeast and after a long winding course loses itself in the gulf of guinea in southern nigeria it has one great tributary the benwe the mother of waters which rises near lake chad and flowing through a region populated by millions empties into the niger several hundred miles from its mouth the niger like the nile has its times of high water and low water and it also carries quantities of fertilizing material during the floods the water spreads far out over the country and in those regions where it flows near the desert there are great areas of irrigated farms such as we saw in the valley of the nile the vegetation is similar we shall see mules donkeys and camels feeding in the fields and palm trees waving their long feathery branches over flat-roofed mud villages farther downstream where we now are much of the river is walled with forests we travel long distances without seeing anything but alligators upon the banks monkeys in the trees and now and then a black hippopotamus swimming with its pink nose just out of the water at one place we meet some english hunters who have killed a hippopotamus the great beast lies upon its side in the marshes on the banks of the river with a score of native boatmen standing about its mouth is wide open and we can see the great teeth which will be saved for ivory as we go onward the country grows more open we pass through plains upon which sheep goats and cattle are feeding the sheep have long hair instead of wool and the cattle have humps on their backs the flocks are watched by shepherds and we frequently see black-skinned natives on the bank the men are often armed and they brandish their weapons as we go by sometimes they are good-natured and beckon us to land there are women washing their clothes on the edges of the stream and little half-naked children playing on the shore now and then a ferry-boat goes from one bank to the other with a cargo of animals and people and we often pass other boats belonging to traders who are carrying their wares up or down stream parts of our way are through rapids where we have to be pulled or pushed with poles in other places the water is low and great beds of tall grasses impede navigation our journey is slow but every day brings new pictures and new things in nature and man we see strange tribes and strange animals now getting a shot at a monkey and now at one of the wonderful birds which inhabit the forests of africa there are kingfishers as blue as the sky black crows with white breasts great flocks of guinea fowls and pelicans which as our boat nears them rise in awkward flight from the river where they are fishing the trees are as wonderful as the birds there are some that yield guta percha others palm nuts and palm oil and some from which come flour cheese and butter we have seen palm trees with a sap which turns into wine and have heard of trees which yield chocolate sugar and bread fruit but these trees seem stranger still the carita or butter tree has a bark and trunk similar to our chestnut tree and leaves somewhat like those of the pear tree 
it grows very large and has nuts so full of oil that when boiled in water the oil rises and can be skimmed off as it cools it hardens and is molded into blocks which look more like tallow than butter the natives use this butter in many parts of the sudan the oily nuts are each enclosed in a flesh which tastes much like a peach it is so sweet that the people make candy of it the nata or flower tree has large pods containing flour of a yellow color somewhat sweet to the taste and the cheese tree which the natives call the baga produces a fruit which tastes like cheese and a fiber nearly as fine as silk traveling on northward we reach the edge of the sahara and later stop at the port of timbuktu north of the niger about nine miles away there are camels and donkeys near the landing strange-looking men are loading and unloading goods packs are being taken from donkeys and camels and put into boats to be carried up and down stream and other boats are unloading their wares for the camels negroes are doing the work and long-gowned men are ordering them about there are turregs with veiled faces arabs in turbans and many other strange characters from the different parts of the sahara and the sudan we ride over the sands to timbuktu passing now and then the skeleton of a camel or horse which has fallen and died on the way the town looks quite imposing in the distance it grows less so as we approach it and when we pass through its half-ruined walls we find only a mass of rude one-story and two-story houses many of which are falling to pieces the doors of some of the buildings are gone the flat roofs have broken in and there are huts of mud and straw in the middle of town timbuktu was once one of the greatest cities of africa but it has declined and now contains only a few thousand people we shall find a more important place in jenna farther up the niger jenna and timbuktu might be called parts of the same business city although it takes several weeks to go by boat from one to the other many of the rich merchants who do business in timbuktu have their homes and business places in jenna but also keep warehouses and stores at timbuktu because of its situation on the edge of the sahara not far from the niger it is this situation that has made timbuktu an important place it is the end of five great caravan routes which cross the desert from morocco algeria and other places north of the sahara so that goods from all of these regions and from the oases are landed at timbuktu and thence taken on the niger to different parts of its mighty basin at the same time slaves gold dust ivory gums and the other products of the sudan are brought to timbuktu to be sent across the desert the town has also a connection through the niger and senegal rivers and the railroad with the port of st louis on the atlantic coast so that goods far and from the other continents are shipped out and in by that way in the past when almost the whole trade was by caravan timbuktu was far more important at about the time of the discovery of america it was the capital of the Songhai empire which was so large that it is said it took travelers six months to cross it this empire lasted about one hundred years and was finally overthrown by the armies of morocco the Songhai were a mixture of the white and black races and their descendants had black or brown faces and long kinky hair there are now many fulahs among them the people of timbuktu remind us of those we saw during our travels along the mediterranean there are moors in burnouses arabs in turbans and gowns tuaregs in veils dark-faced jews and negroes of every description there are women and girls with faces unveiled wearing long gowns which fall from their necks to their feet and children dressed much like those we saw in the valley of the nile these people are mohammedans there are many sheiks and priests and we hear them call the hours of prayer from the mosques everyone is polite and we have little trouble in seeing what we want if we are polite in return we visit the warehouses packed full of dates salt blocks ivory tusks and bales of ostrich feathers there are also european goods of many kinds and especially cotton hardware and arms we watch the loading of the camels which are to start across the sahara many of them are only half loaded when they start out we ask why this is and are told that the rest of the burdens will be made up at the salt mines on the way 
on one of the caravan routes in the midst of the sahara there is a mine of rock salt which supplies many of the oases and a large part of the sudan the salt is dug out in great lumps and then trimmed into blocks about a yard long and a foot and a half wide in which shape it can be easily packed on the backs of the camels the salt is thus brought to timbuktu and is shipped from here to all parts of the niger basin we have seen it sold in the village markets where the blocks broken into pieces always command a good price we are more than two weeks going from timbuktu to jenna the river flows close to the desert most of the way and on both sides of it are irrigated farms jenna stands on an island surrounded by branches of the niger its people owning most of the lands for miles about it is better built than any other town we have seen since we left egypt its streets are wide and its houses are of brick of one and two stories and so plastered within and without that a house looks as though it were cut from one block of stone most of the buildings have flat roofs and some have clay pipes extending out over the street to carry off the water when it rains jenna is a busy city it has large mosques warehouses and stores there are crowds at the wharves loading and unloading boats and donkeys with packs on their backs go in long files through the streets there are many men carrying burdens and at certain times of the day the business sections are crowded we spend some hours in the market an open place in about the centre of the town with shops on three sides of it and a mosque on the fourth here are hundreds of people buying and selling women and men sit on the ground with their wares spread about them money changers with piles of cowrie shells before them stand ready to exchange them for gold and silver here are two boys peddling sweetmeats and cakes and beyond them a butcher who stands in front of his shop with joints of meat hung from its roof and live sheep behind ready to be killed and cut up according to the demand into roasts and chops near the butcher shops are little ovens upon which one may roast his meat free of charge if he buys his wood from that fuel seller next door we spend some time in the cloth stores purchase some perfumery at one of the scent shops and stop a while to look at the barbers shaving the heads of their customers out in the street later on we go to the great mosque where the worshippers are praying and on the same day see a mohammedan school the children squat about their teacher out in the street and write sentences from the koran singing them again and again to commit them to memory these people are famous among the central africans for their learning they are also celebrated as traders and their boats loaded with goods carry much of the commerce of this part of the world from jenna we travel some distance farther up the niger by boat we then cross the country by caravan to the little railroad built by the french this takes us to caius on the senegal where we get steamers for the port of st louis on the atlantic ocean end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the spanish possessions we might take a ship at st louis and travel northward to visit the territory which spain has on the west coast the trip however would be much out of our way and as the country is about the same as some through which we have traveled we shall not take the time the spanish possessions begin in the neighborhood of cape blanco and extend several hundred miles northward to morocco and eastward far into the sahara their territory altogether is equal to about six states the size of ohio but the greater part of it is sandy wastes without rivers or any large oases it is consequently thinly populated its inhabitants being somewhat like the Turegs and the other people we saw during our travels in the sahara spanish africa is ruled by the governor of the canary islands with a sub-governor at the town of rio de oro on the coast in addition to this territory spain has the island of fernando po and several other little islands in the gulf of guinea and also a small tract on the mainland between cameroon and the french congo both the islands and the coastal territories are unhealthful 
the land is swampy it is covered with a luxuriant vegetation and contains vast forests from which are gathered india rubber and palm oil its only foreigners are some spanish french and english merchants the natives are negroes of a low type being much the same as those of cameroon and the french congo whom we shall see farther on in our travels these possessions have but few harbors and the rivers are generally unnavigable End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the home of the negro our next journeys are to be in that part of africa which might be called the true home of the negro we shall travel southward along the atlantic ocean and eastward and southward along the gulf of guinea until we come to the great river congo up the valley of which we shall go for thousands of miles so far the people we have met have been largely of the white race although there were many negroes among them from now on they will be almost all black they will have woolly hair black skins thick lips and flat noses not unlike the pure africans of the united states indeed it is from this region that most of the slaves of our country south america and the west indies came they were bought or captured by slave traders who came to the gulf of guinea and thence carried their cargoes to portugal and across the atlantic or directly across the atlantic to brazil the west indies and at times even to our own ports one region furnished so many slaves that it was known as the slave coast although slaves were taken from all of the countries of western africa and at one time from all parts of the continent the land along the gulf of guinea is very unhealthful it lies near the equator and much of it is low and swampy nearly all europeans or americans who stay long are attacked by fever and many die nevertheless the blacks thrive there are many millions of them in this region they are divided up into hundreds of tribes each having its own semi-barbarous customs the tribes are different from one another in form feature and language some are tall and well formed having full chests and broad shoulders others such as the crews found in liberia and along the coast are shorter but are very strong being employed to load and unload the boats at the ports nearer the congo are dwarfs or pygmies little black people who when full grown are no larger than our boys and girls of fourteen the natives of the coast where they come in contact with the whites and in the north where they mix with the mohammedans wear more or less clothing but in the wilds of the interior many go almost naked wearing only a waist cloth or petticoat of bark or skins at the ports we shall find people fully clad in bright colored cottons from europe the women wear bandana handkerchiefs about their heads and the gayer their calico dresses the better they are pleased all are fond of jewelry and in some tribes the jewelry is valuable this is so in the countries which produce gold where we may now and then see men and women wearing bracelets anklets or earrings of gold in other regions the men have bracelets of ivory and along the lower niger the women have heavy ivory anklets through which their feet were thrust when they were little girls and which cannot now be taken off in some tribes they wear brass rods as thick as stair rods wound about their legs from the ankles to the knees such rods are often welded about the leg when the woman is married and kept there for the rest of her life many natives wear necklaces of glass beads others have cowrie shells either strung or sewed upon cloth as head ornaments among the oddest of the negro customs is the way of arranging the hair although all the tribes are woolly headed each person seems to have his own peculiar headdress some stiffen the hair with oil and clay and then put it up in curious shapes in one tribe the women plait the hair so that it hangs from the head like little black worms in another they wind it up in a knob on the crown and in a third they dress it so that it stands out like two antelope horns or rises from the top of the head 
in a pillar or tower some tribes shave their heads in spots and others wear the hair so that it spreads out like a fan the men grow no hair on the face except perhaps a tuft on the chin which makes them look curious most of these negroes are tattooed and many have peculiar scars on their faces and breasts it is said that one can tell to what tribe a person belongs by the scars on his face the scars are made in youth coloring matter being rubbed into the wounds so that the marks are indelible these different negro tribes live in villages of mud huts thatched with straw or palm leaves sometimes the villages are surrounded by mud walls and sometimes the huts of a family will be built inside a wall so that a village is made up of a great many walled spaces each given up to one family several villages are often governed by a chief or king some of the tribes are large having armies which keep order and engage in slave raiding and wars with their neighbors the king of dahomey for instance is said to have an army of women who are as brave as any army of men the king picks out his soldiers when they are girls and has them trained they are taught to shoot and fence and to endure all sorts of hardships they are not allowed to marry and their whole lives are devoted to warfare many of these negroes have little farms about their villages where they raise millet rice peanuts sweet potatoes yams and indian corn they cultivate the soil in a rude way burning the ground over to clear it and digging it up with native spades and hoes the women do most of the work and in many tribes they are little more than the slaves of their husbands nearly every man has several wives and the more wives he has the richer he is thought to be for his wives can work for him we frequently see women hoeing in the garden they carry great burdens on their heads and even paddle canoes with babies slung to their backs near several of the ports plantations of cotton and cacao have been set out and both women and men work in them in some of the negro tribes the people are skilled in weaving and working in leather in others they smelt iron and make things out of brass and steel they mold pottery for their cooking utensils and carve ivory and wood parts of the country contain gold which the natives wash from the streams other tribes have many hunters who kill elephants and hippopotamuses and there are robber tribes who hire themselves out as fighters and slave raiders in the interior of this country slavery is practiced although the foreign governments are trying to do away with it there are also regions where the people still eat human beings chiefly slaves and those whom they capture in war nearly every tribe along the gulf of guinea and throughout central and southern africa believes in charms and witches the natives think that there are spirits in the trees and bushes in caves and in other places they have witch doctors who pretend to tell whether a man or a woman is a witch and who cause persons to be killed by accusing them of witchcraft nearly everybody has one or more fetishes or charms which will he thinks protect him from harm bring him good luck or enable him to defeat his enemies or drive away sickness the african boy hears of such charms as soon as he is able to talk one of his friends for instance has a fetish which he says will make him rich another may have one to keep away witches and others those which stop or bring rain or enable one to discover theft as the boy grows older he wants a fetish of his own and he goes to the charm doctor and learns how to get or make one he soon comes to think that the charm is the most important of his possessions and that if any one gets hold of it he might cause his death he pretends to feed it and if he has bad luck he thinks it is caused by the charms or fetishes of his enemies which may be more powerful than his own such charms are made of all sorts of things a bit of hippopotamus tooth elephant skin or an ostrich feather may be used also snakes heads hawk claws horns of small antelopes stones seeds nuts and beans or any other things made of bone and wood many of the charms are images of human beings rudely carved some small and some large a town will often have as its charm a large image which it keeps in a shed and which the people suppose protects the town they think such an image enables the witch-doctor 
to detect thieves and on account of it the people are afraid to steal the natives of central and southern africa are grossly superstitious and in some places they even make human sacrifices in some regions cannibalism has been practiced for ages henry m stanley the explorer found human flesh for sale in the markets of the congo valley and other travelers tell how slaves were fattened for food and how warlike expeditions were made in order that the captives taken might be eaten some customs still prevail in some regions although they are fast dying out in nearly all parts of the country however missionaries are now working we shall see mission schools as we go on with our travels some of the people are already more civilized than they were in the past and under the control of the governments of great britain germany and france to which the chief colonies belong it is to be hoped that cannibalism slavery and witchcraft will in time pass away end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Africa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Africa, by Frank G. Carpenter. Senegambia, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. The Cruise we have left st louis and have travelled by railroad through senegal to dakar a french naval station on cape verde we are now on the western end of the continent and as near our hemisphere as we shall be during our african tour we find ships at dakar bound southward along the coast and take passage we call it bathurst at the mouth of the gambia river in the little colony of gambia belonging to great britain the town has about six thousand inhabitants and among them many people who speak english our steamer stays but a short time and then carries us on south along the coast of portuguese guinea and french guinea to freetown the capital of the british colony of sierra leone the word sierra leone means the mountain of the lion so named it is said from a great hill back of freetown which looks like a lion crouching or ready to spring sierra leone is about as large as maine it is a well-peopled country having numerous tribes who live in villages surrounded by mud walls about eight feet in height the houses are usually circular huts roofed with thatch so made that a part of the roof extends beyond the walls shading a veranda where the people rest in the daytime much of sierra leone is covered with grass and there are many cattle there are also antelopes and other kinds of game freetown has about forty thousand people among whom are many english and germans the city has several newspapers it has broad streets upon which are one-story and two-story buildings of brick and stone roofed with galvanized iron along the shore are great warehouses and factories there are large steamers at the wharves and we learn that the place has a considerable trade sending ivory palm oil gums and other native products to europe and importing cotton goods hardware and american tobacco we call upon the governor of the colony see the black native soldiers directed by british officers go through their exercises and spend some time in the english stores laying in supplies for our journey we visit the market where we buy delicious pineapples oranges and other fruit and pay a porter a few cents to carry them on his head to our ship leaving freetown we steam on to the negro republic of liberia this territory is about five hundred miles long and in some places it stretches inland for two hundred miles it is as large as indiana and is noted for its fertile soil it has a population of more than two million negroes mostly savage tribes who are ruled by chiefs they are much like the other natives we have seen in addition to the savages liberia has about sixty thousand negroes who are more or less civilized they are especially interesting to us for many of them are the descendants of negroes from the united states 
this republic was founded by citizens of the united states who gave it the name liberia which means the land of the free our people thought that if some of the american negroes were sent back to africa they could found there a republic where they would live happily and civilize their neighbors liberia was chosen as the place and a government was planned modeled upon that of the united states this is the government of liberia today the country has a president and congress at monrovia the capital and the civilized negroes are governed by them the officials are elected by the people but only negroes are allowed to vote our ship calls at monrovia and we have time to visit the president and see the congress in session we learn that the experiment has not been a very great success monrovia has but five thousand inhabitants and the civilized negroes have only a few villages along the coast they have small plantations of coffee but there are no large farms and the territory governed as a republic is comparatively small liberia is the home of the crews or crewmen who are famous as sailors they are to be found on all the ships along the western coast they manage many of the boats at the ports and they may be seen everywhere loading and unloading vessels they are fine-looking black men strong and muscular we have some on board and gangs are at the wharves at each stop of the steamer every crew has a broad blue streak extending from his forehead to the end of his nose we are told this is a tribal mark put there by his mother in infancy and that it is intended as a pledge that its owner will die before he will submit to slavery very few of the crews ever become slaves they are industrious and thrifty some of them speak english and we enjoy talking to those who are on the steamer each part of the shore along which we are now travelling once had its own name off liberia was the pepper coast or grain coast farther on bordering the french possessions was the ivory coast off ashanti was the gold coast and farther still the slave coast the grain coast was so named because there was a kind of pepper or grain which came from there which was used for export the ivory coast furnished many elephants tusks the slave coast was the favorite resort of the slave trader and back of the gold coast much gold has been found we sail from monrovia along the ivory coast to ashanti where we call at Accra the port and thence make our way inland to kumasi the capital this region now belongs to the british and there are many english companies trading and mining in it there is a railroad from Accra to kumasi and roads are being built through some parts of the country we take interpreters at Accra and travel here and there studying the land and the people the country is beautiful there are hills and valleys and great plains there are vast forests bound together with vines in which are enormous baobab trees with white blossoms and a fruit the size of a musk melon from which a drink somewhat like lemonade is made there are also bamboo and fern trees and we find bananas pineapples and other fruits for sale ashanti is thickly peopled by negroes there are many villages of mud houses thatched with palm leaves or straw some of the villages have mud walls about them and some are composed of a large number of yards or compounds inside which the houses are built sometimes there will be several houses in one compound some devoted to the slaves or servants some to the storehouses and others to the owner and his wives such a compound may be the home of one rich man the poor man will often have only one mud hut for his whole family kumasi is the old capital it is quite a large place surrounded by mud walls and divided up by many streets which have been worn into ruts by the bare feet of the people we visit the market-place where hundreds are buying and selling making a great noise as they haggle over the prices they are mostly women and girls some quite well clad and others having only a cloth about their bodies fastened tightly under the arms and falling to the feet some have babies astride the hip and others have babies slung to their backs the wares are fruits yams meat fowls and bright cotton cloths over there women are selling fuel medicine and hardware others have pipes and tobacco 
here is a girl with musical instruments and there an old woman who has a lot of quacking ducks for sale in other places they are selling jewelry of ivory and gold bright colored native cloths and tools and swords of iron or steel here and there through the markets are guards blowing trumpets warning the people to keep order and making more noise than all the rest there are many ashanti tribes some of which are almost savage in the past the king cut off the heads of his subjects at will and in kumasi one might often see a score of human heads hung upon poles stealing was punished by death and when the king died a large number of his wives and slaves were killed in order that he might have servants in the next world on our way back to Accra, we see flocks of gray parrots and other curious birds there are so many trees which seem to have coffee bags hanging to their branches we soon discover they are not bags at all but the nests of the golden oriole a beautiful bird which lays its eggs in the lower end of the nest entering it by a hole so placed that only something which flies can get into it this is to keep the monkeys which infest the trees of this region from stealing the eggs farther down the coast we skirt the german colony of togo which is densely populated by negroes and thence go on to dahomey which belongs to the french and is peopled by blacks in both countries there are many small farms the natives grow maize manioc yams and potatoes they have sheep goats and poultry and many small pigs there are rubber trees in the forests and also oil palms and dye woods the germans have planted coconuts along the coast and set out coffee plantations they have built some short railroads and are trying to develop their colony the french are also building railroads in dahomey and have put up many hundred miles of telegraph lines End of chapter 30chapter thirty one of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b lagos a visit to a west african factory we have left dahomey and have come to the island of lagos off the shores of southern nigeria we are in the chief british settlement of the niger territory and in one of the largest foreign towns of the western coast lagos is quite european in appearance it has many comfortable houses of one story and two stories with large gardens in which there are palms and other beautiful trees it has a wide road along the shore where we may see english boys and girls riding and driving with their parents there are quite a number of stores kept by englishmen and several large trading houses the trading houses of western africa are called factories they are devoted to importing goods of different kinds from europe and the united states and exchanging them for the native products brought in on boats and by porters from all parts of the country the ordinary factory is a large wooden building with a roof of galvanized iron it has several rooms including a store a cooper shop and often great cauldrons for boiling palm oil in one part of the warehouse may be seen bales of cotton boxes of tobacco bags of salt packages of hardware and beads to be sold to the natives and perhaps in the same room ivory tusks dye wood gums and other such things which have been taken in exchange among the chief exports of this part of africa are palm oil and the kernels of palm nuts these products come from the oil palm which thrives everywhere along the gulf coast and which is so numerous that thousands of natives are engaged in gathering the nuts and making the oil the oil palm has no leaves except at the top of the tree where the fruit grows in great bunches or cones at the base of the leaves some of the cones will weigh as much as seventeen pounds each and a single cone may contain as many as seven hundred nuts each as large as a horse chestnut the negro climbs the tree with a long hoop of rattan which he fastens around it he then steps inside the hoop and raises it so that one curve rests against the tree above him and the other upon his back he now puts his bare feet on the trunk and by a succession of jerks walks right up to the top he then cuts off the cones and throws them to the ground they are left there for a few days 
and the nuts shrink and drop out they are now boiled in water to remove the outside shell which is lined with a fiber saturated with oil the fiber is crushed from the kernels of the nuts in large mortars and is then placed in clay vats filled with water the native women get into the vats and tramp the fiber to press out the oil it rises to the surface and is skimmed off after this the fiber and shells are again boiled and the oil is skimmed from the surface it is of a dirty yellow color but it is so valuable for making soap axle grease and other things that it is exported to europe by the thousands of tons the kernels of the nuts are also valuable for the same purpose they are dried and thus sent to europe where they are ground up and the oil is pressed out of them is not this a wonderful tree yes but it has other virtues in addition to those already described its leaves are used to thatch the huts and from their fibre mats hats and other things are made at the root of the leaves there is a heart called the palm cabbage which is eaten as a vegetable when boiled it tastes like parsnips and its neck is said to have the flavour of the finest asparagus the natives tap this cabbage when it is on the tree and fasten a gourd to it a sap which looks somewhat like ginger beer thereupon flows out into the gourd it ferments and in a short time turns to wine the natives use palm oil for lighting and cooking and also for greasing their hair and skins another remarkable tree found here and in many other parts of the african continent is the baobab or monkey bread tree the baobab is one of the largest of trees it is not so tall as some others but it grows to a thickness of from twenty to thirty feet and is sometimes as much as one hundred feet in circumference it has enormous branches often as thick as the trunk of a great oak and its blossoms are balls of pure white four or five inches across the fruit of the baobab is a gourd fourteen or fifteen inches long with a stem two or three feet long the flesh inside is red with a yellowish tint it has seeds embedded in it the natives pound up the seeds into meal and they use the shells to carry water or to bail out canoes and to hold salt and other things the leaves of this tree when young are eaten as a vegetable they are a bright green and somewhat like the leaves of a horse chestnut the wood is peculiar it is not good for lumber as it is composed of fibres separated by layers of pith the inner bark has so many fibres that it is often stripped off and made into paper it can be twisted into strings and ropes and the natives sometimes pull out the fibres and make bags and nets of them the inside of the baobab tree often rots so that the tree becomes hollow in this case it is sometimes used as a water barrel being filled during the wet season or at the time of a storm and drawn off when needed after the rains have passed end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the yorubans southern nigeria there is a railroad from lagos into the land of the yorubans one of the largest tribes of southern nigeria the road crosses the swampy lagoon which lies between the island and the mainland and then goes up the valley of the ogun river to the great native cities of abe okuta and ibadan this whole country is a network of streams and we wind our way in and out over the waterways now through dense forests where the trees are bound together with vines and now over plains spotted with beautiful groves we pass villages of huts made of sticks woven together and covered with mud the roofs are of thatch and many of the huts are enclosed by mud walls near every village are small farms in which women are working the crops we see little fields of indian corn yams sweet potatoes and peanuts and now and then a patch of sugar-cane or tobacco there are fruit trees here and there and delicious oranges and pineapples are brought to the windows where the train stops every village has ducks chickens and pigeons and flocks of guinea-fowls 
in the plains there are sheep covered with hair some of them so gentle that they trot along like dogs at the heels of the children as they go to and fro over the little farms we are told that each sheep has its own name it knows the voice of its owner and will come when it is called at last we reach abiokuta the largest city of the yorubans it has a population of about two hundred thousand and its mud huts extend for six miles up and down the banks of the ogun river there is a mud wall about it and in its centre an enormous rock from which the city gets its name for abiokuta means under a rock the city is divided into a vast number of yards with narrow lanes leading here and there through them but with no fixed streets each yard has a mud wall surrounding it against which the houses are so built that the wall forms the back of each room the roofs are of thatch beginning at the wall and extending over the rooms they are ridge shaped and so long that they cover a sort of veranda or porch along the front of each house the people live on the porches as well as inside while sheep goats chicken and pigs are kept in the yards nearly every enclosure has a little pigeon coat and also posts to which the horses are tied some of the richer yorubans have large establishments with many rooms for their numerous wives and slaves several families may live in one yard and some have so many dwellings divided up by courts that a stranger might get lost if the bale or ruler of that yard did not show him about the yorubans are even stronger than their houses they belong to a race numbering about four millions which inhabits a large region between dahomey and the lower niger they are negroes but more civilized than the natives we met along the coast all these people excepting the little children wear more or less clothing the women are clad in bright cottons some have cloths wrapped tightly about their persons under their arms which fall on one side to the knee and on the other to the feet others have a cloth about the waist and over the shoulders and some a third cloth tied about the head like a turban many of the women have black babies fastened to their shining black shoulders the little ones laugh and coo as their mothers walk through the streets work in the fields or sell goods in the market now and then a baby cries but this does not bother the mother and it is allowed to cry on some of the men wear loose trousers and cloths about their shoulders others are bare to the waist and have only a white cloth around the loins a few who are mohammedans have turbans and gowns the most of the yoruban men go bareheaded and all are barefooted their features are much like those of our negroes save that every one has more or less scars how many bald men there are that comes from shaving the men shave not only their faces even to the eyebrows and nostrils but also their heads the scars are made in youth every boy being marked with certain cuts denoting his family and tribe the people can tell just who a man is by his scars in company with the guide we make our way through the city watching the natives at work the yorubans have many industries blacksmiths carpenters hat makers and tailors are plying their trades in their homes here they are smelting iron they are making bags and satchels and farther on they are weaving bright colored cloths these people are noted for their tools baskets pottery and jewelry like the other tribes of this region they are fond of music and we often listen to concerts by native bands we go to the market where thousands are buying and selling all sorts of native manufactures together with the grains fruits and vegetables raised on the farms peddlers with their wares on their heads are moving about and many are squatting on the ground with their merchandise piled up before them notice the cowrie shells they are the chief money of the yorubans it takes forty shells to equal an american cent we buy a half bushel and give them to our guide to purchase curios for us to take back home we stop at a cook stand where sweet potatoes are steaming in earthen pots and afterward eat a cake of cornmeal dough fried in palm oil the yorubans have fine fruits and vegetables they have delicious pineapples mangoes and oranges they are fond of ekha which is fermented indian meal 
boiled in large pots to the thickness of cream they steam yams and pound them into a paste which is eaten with sauce another favorite dish is beans stewed in palm oil they eat chickens and muttons and like fat dog meat served with a peculiar sauce wild honey is sold in the market and also sugar cane which the children buy and suck as we do stick candy nearly every one uses snuff but here the people put the snuff on their tongues instead of into their noses the yorubans are still wild and savage although not so barbarous as in the past they are governed by a native king under the direction of the british but they still believe in witch doctors and worship spirits of various kinds there are many missionaries working among them they tell us that the natives are improving but that it will be a long time before they will become what we call civilized taking the train we are soon back at the coast our ship moves along the delta of the great niger river passing its many mouths the country is low and swampy and so unhealthful that we do not attempt to go inland our boat stays a few hours at old calabar at the mouth of the river of that name it is the british capital of southern nigeria and is noted as a trading centre from which ivory palm oil and other native products are shipped to europe here we meet englishmen who have been years in africa they describe the negroes who live along the benu and the lower niger they are less civilized than the yorubans they worship spirits and believe in witchcraft slavery is common and in the past there have been human sacrifices the natives wear but little clothing although they have bracelets and anklets of ivory brass wire and beads the products are about the same as in the regions we have recently visited end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the home of the gorilla cameroon and french congo sailing southward we coast for several days along the shores of cameroon and the french congo two vast provinces belonging to germany and france the land near the sea is low and heavily wooded farther back a range of great mountains rises above the forests like a wall and beyond it are high plateaus covered with grass or woods the home of countless elephants lions leopards antelopes and wild buffaloes in the coastlands are beautiful birds myriads of insects and gorgeous butterflies at night the air is alive with fireflies and phosphorescent beetles and in the daytime strange water birds may be seen along the shore there are ibises cranes and wild ducks swimming or wading about the mouths of the rivers and huge pelicans which are catching fish with their bills and storing them away in the pouches under their necks they continue fishing until their pouches are full and then sit sleepily down in the water to digest the catch at their leisure the pelican's pouch takes the place of our pockets which we sometimes fill with apples to eat later on in the rivers of this part of the world are many crocodiles and families of hippopotamuses while along the banks of the gaboon and the ogowe are the homes of the gorilla and chimpanzee the terrible man-apes the gorilla is the largest and fiercest of the monkey tribe when full grown it is five or six feet tall and looks not unlike a great ugly man covered with thick reddish brown or black hair it has an enormous body with a huge chest and long arms which are so strong that it can take a gun barrel and double it up in its hands it has hands like a man with a thumb and four long fingers its feet serve also as hands so that it can climb trees as well as the smallest monkey gorillas are usually found far from the settlements in the loneliest and darkest parts of the jungle they live in families a papa gorilla a mamma gorilla and the children gorillas staying together sometimes a family will sleep at the foot of a tree and sometimes in it high up from the ground making a bed like a hammock by tying the branches together with vines and laying leaves upon them these beasts feed upon the fruits nuts vegetables and roots which grow wild in the woods 
they eat small animals and birds being especially fond of eggs and hunting birds nests to get them gorillas are very fierce they shun man but if attacked will fight to the death when surprised the children gorillas run away but the parents stay to keep off the enemy pounding their huge chests with rage and roaring with a noise like thunder they gnash their sharp white teeth and if they can get hold of one's gun will bite dents in the iron chimpanzees are much the same as gorillas although not so large they usually go about on all fours but can walk erect better than other monkeys they climb the trees swinging themselves from branch to branch but what kind of people live in these regions we can tell something of the inhabitants from the men at the ports they are much like the natives we saw along the gulf of guinea with now and then a trader or hunter similar to the people of northern nigeria west of lake chad cameroon and the french congo extend northward to lake chad and the sahara the german province of cameroon being about as large as the whole german empire and the french congo three times the size of france both countries have a large population of many tribes those along the coast are negroes while farther back are mixed races with different customs and beliefs those of the far west are chiefly mohammedans some of these tribes are very barbarous slavery is common and in the interior cannibalism is frequently practised among the most important races are the fans they are more intelligent than their neighbours being especially noted for smelting iron and making knives spearheads and axes the fans are skilled elephant hunters they drive the animals into pits and then kill them with spears we spend a while at cameroon the seat of the german government under the high cameroon mountain and also at libreville and loango in the french congo they are small towns with only a few europeans consisting of the merchants and officials and some missionaries and teachers the country is unhealthful and every white man is almost sure to have fever we visit the factories to learn about the exports seeing their great quantities of rubber dyewoods ebony palm oil and ivory in the markets we watch the dealers selling peanuts tobacco cacao and coffee from the new plantations near by both germany and france are trying to develop their colonies and are planting cotton coffee cacao cloves vanilla ginger and pepper they have established schools and are cutting out roads to open up parts of the country end of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of carpenter's geographical reader africa this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter the congo and its basin we have left luango and are steaming along on our way to the congo the ocean is already brown with the silt from the river the screw of our steamer turns up the green sea from under the brown and churns all to a chocolate foam we are approaching the mouth of one of the largest rivers on earth the congo while not so long as the nile is greater in volume than any other river in africa is greater in volume than the mississippi and is second only to the amazon it drains a basin as large as half of the united states proper and carries down so much sediment every year that if it could be piled up in one place it would form a hill a mile square and almost as high as the washington monument the congo is as long as the distance from new york to san francisco and two of its tributaries the kasai and the ubangi are each almost as long as the distance from the atlantic ocean to the great salt lake the river has many tributaries and its navigable waterways if stretched out in one line would reach about halfway around the globe so numerous are the rivers that there is hardly a spot in the whole basin that is eighty miles distant from a navigable waterway from its mouth to matadi about one hundred miles inland the congo is more like a long lake than a river it is five or six miles wide and in many places three hundred feet deep from matadi 
to stanley pool about two hundred miles there is a series of cataracts but above that to stanley falls are more than one thousand miles of open river upon which steamboats can travel as well as upon the mississippi or the lower parts of the hudson still farther inland are long stretches of fine waterways the river extending on and on with many tributaries until at last it is connected by the lukuga with lake tanganyika and by the luapula and the lualaba with other great lakes farther south not far from the watershed of the zambezi on the north the headwaters of its tributaries come very close to those of lake albert lake victoria and the other headwaters of the nile the congo basin is one of the wonders of nature except where the river breaks through it is shut in from the atlantic by a wall of mountains there are highlands all about it and scientists tell us that it was once covered by a vast inland sea from five hundred to one thousand feet deep and so large that the evaporation of its waters filled the air with moisture giving rains to a great part of the sahara and libyan deserts then the lake began to overflow at the west through a sandy pass in the mountains the waters cut the pass down into the gorge where the cataracts of the congo now are and before long they made a deep trough out to the ocean as the gorge grew deeper and deeper more and more of the waters flowed off until the land was left as it is to-day this happened ages ago and now all the water that falls in the basin is carried out to the sea by the congo the basin is covered with vast forests and grassy plains it is inhabited by wild animals birds and insects and by millions of more or less savage men we shall see all this for ourselves as we travel up the river the water grows muddy as we steam onward the green of the sea disappears and as we enter the wide mouth of the congo the river has the color of pea soup now we have a strong current and our ship goes more slowly there are natives here and there fishing in rude boats far out in the stream enormous crocodiles are sleeping on the sandbanks and from time to time storks pelicans or wild geese fly over us now we see a flock of wild ducks and now white cranes flying together float like a great sheet across the sky we pass banana point a long sandy peninsula formed by the ocean and river on which some factories or warehouses are located and steam onward eighty miles farther up to boma the african seat of the belgian government which rules the great congo state the country is flat and covered with woods there are many creeks flowing into the river we pass large islands and numerous sandbanks we can see boma long before we come to it the town has two parts one consisting of warehouses and other business buildings lies close to the water and the other containing the public offices churches stores schools and homes of the foreigners is on the hills farther back a tramway with a little steam engine and open cars runs from one town to the other our ship anchors at a long iron pier and belgian officers in uniform come upon board while black-faced bare-legged policemen in blue zouave suits and white helmets stay on the pier to keep back the natives we land and walk to a hotel in the lower part of the city black congo boys carry our baggage up to our rooms they do not understand english and we have to make signs to get what we want later we visit the governor-general and his officials to learn about the country and to plan our tour the greater part of the basin of the congo is now a dependency of belgium it is known as the congo independent state and it has been divided up into fourteen districts each of which has a ruling commissioner sent out from belgium and some native and foreign soldiers to keep the people in order it is estimated that there are twenty millions in the belgian congo the people are more intelligent and more civilized than the negroes along the gulf of guinea and they differ from them in color and features most of them have brown skins and some have straight noses and small hands and feet they are usually tall and fine-looking some have wavy hair while others have little curls like wool they are bantus a mixture of the negro races and the races we saw in northern africa which long ago crossed over from asia and gradually populated this country 
the bantus are to be found about the great lakes and in the valley of the congo they also live in most parts of southern africa except in the southwest where are the little black-skinned hottentots and bushmen they are divided up into tribes ranging in number from a few hundred families to many thousands each ruled by a king or chief each tribe has its own country and many have villages the bantus have various habits and customs and are peaceful and industrious and others are warlike and bad all are superstitious believing in witches and spirits everybody has his fetish and every tribe its witch doctor many bantus are cannibals nearly all have at times held slaves and slavery is still common in some parts of the country the different tribes make war upon one another so that their villages are like armed camps with the people always on the outlook for an enemy these people speak a language far different from that of the natives of morocco algeria and egypt a language which is much the same throughout the whole bantu race although each tribe has its own dialect the bantus of the congo valley to some extent govern themselves but each district is also under the control of a belgian commissioner and his agents and officials the governor-general at boma gives us letters to the various commissioners and by his advice we take one of the government steamers to the port of matadi here is a railroad which the belgians have built about the cataracts to carry passengers and freight between the ocean and the vast system of navigable waters which extends from stanley pool to the different parts of the congo basin the road is only two hundred and fifty miles long but in proportion to its length it is one of the most important railroads of the world for it opens up the central part of the african continent our ride is most picturesque the cars are open at the sides we go slowly and can see almost as well as though we were traveling in a carriage much of the track is far back from the river and the road curves this way and that as it climbs the hills now we cross a great chasm matted with jungle now pass through forests where the trees are bound together with vines and now are so close to the congo that we can see the mighty river boiling along through the gorges on its way to the ocean at last we reach the plateau and then drop to leopoldville under the shadow of mount leopold at the southwestern corner of stanley pool there are half a dozen great river steamers at the wharves and we learn that we can get ships which will carry us far up the congo End of chapter 34、chapter、thirty five of Carpenter's Geographical Reader Africa by Frank G. Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Life upon the Congo. We have been traveling for weeks upon the Congo River, steaming along from village to village, now stopping to visit a market. And now making long excursions into the country to study the people. After leaving Leopoldville, we were several hours crossing Stanley Pool. It is a great lake right in the course of the Congo, twenty five miles long and fifteen miles wide, with many islands. Some of the islands are floating, they are made of reeds and grass, with roots so firmly knotted together that birds and even men can stand upon them. They have been torn from the mainland by the current and are moving on down toward the sea. Other islands are fixed, and upon some of them are hippopotamuses which have swum across from the mainland. As we go on up the Congo in our comfortable steamer, the river widens and narrows. We are often close to the shores and can observe the strange vegetable and animal life upon its banks. There are many alligators lying like brown logs on the edge of the water. Near them stand hippopotamuses which yawn at us, showing their great teeth, and now and then we see a rose pink baby hippopotamus on the back of its mother, which is swimming with little more than her nose out of the water. There are water birds of all kinds. We see storks and wild geese, and now and then shoot at a flock of gray parrots as they fly over our boat, whistling and screaming. There are parrots in the oil palm trees on the banks, and at one of the villages. A boy brings several to the steamer for sale. The birds are not so fine as the bright colored parrots of South America and Australia, but they have a variety of notes 
and whistle most beautifully there are many other birds the names of which we do not know there are cuckoos parrots and woodpeckers hornbills large and small tree ducks great kingfishers giant herons eagles hawks vultures and enormous bats there are pigeons with greenish-gray bodies and plantain birds of bright blue with yellowish breasts and strangest of all little crocodile birds which play about the crocodiles on the banks perching upon them and warning them when any one comes near and then the animals we never get tired of looking at the hippopotamuses especially the babies which are bright pink and at the monkeys which hang over the water chattering at us from the trees now we see an elephant bathing in the river by moonlight and now catch sight of a red river hog or red buffalo peeping at us through the long grass on the banks the mosquitoes are terribly troublesome and when we take a swim in the congo there are horrible little black flies which attack us in clouds settling on every spot of bare skin sucking our blood there are ants as fierce as those we saw in the upper niger and every night we go over our feet carefully searching for jiggers we have to look out for snakes and centipedes and also for wasps and bees there are many beautiful locusts bright colored beetles and butterflies of the most gorgeous description the country changes from time to time as we go onward and our journeys on shore are full of new and strange things now we pass through groves where wild flowers are blooming under the trees and now see woods bound together into a jungle by long vines there are orchids growing from the branches and trunks of the trees and many strange climbing plants much of the country is treeless but covered with grass so high that it is more difficult to travel there than through the forests the stalks grow so thick that one cannot see far and the blades are so sharp that they scratch our faces the stalks are often twelve feet in height so that as we walk along the paths we seem to be in a narrow aisle walled with green on each side wherever the grass is bent over it twists itself around our ankles and when it rains the blades become loaded with water which drops down upon us as we push our way through the path becomes a ditch and we walk in a little stream splashing our way whipped by the great stalks at every turn such paths serve as the high roads of the congo valley and it is along roads like this that we make our way over the country from village to village almost the whole continent is covered with footpaths and one can go everywhere by following these narrow winding ways through forest and plain the natives travel on foot and the myriad paths have been worn down by the bare feet of thousands who month by month and year by year have for generations been going over the same ground single file the forest paths are more winding than those of the open country and turns are made to avoid fallen trees and other obstacles but they are everywhere narrow and regularly traveled we walk carefully as we go along single file looking out for quagmires and pitfalls as we approach the villages sometimes prodding the leaves on the road to see if the ground is solid the native tribes are always warring upon one another the villages are protected by stockades and along the roads leading to them sharpened sticks dipped in poison are stuck in the ground and covered with leaves which look as though they had fallen from the trees near by these sticks will run into one's foot if he steps upon them and the poison is so strong that a scratch causes death the people are most interesting we come upon new tribes every week and they vary so much in customs and features that we despair of remembering them all some are as black as the negroes of the gulf coast and look not unlike them some are dark brown and others almost yellow they all belong to this bantu race which we shall meet with everywhere from now on many of the men have scars on their faces and other parts of the body the scars are different in different tribes and one can tell to what family a person belongs by his scars many of the people go almost naked and some have little more than a strip of cotton about the waist the chiefs of some tribes wear enormous straw hats shaped like a stovepipe waist cloths and jewelry of brass or shells the women have short petticoats of grass which stand out from the body 
and other tribes they wear bark cloth or bright colored cottons all grease themselves with oil and put up their hair with oil and clay each tribe has its own way of dressing the hair in some the women and sometimes the men wear it in a great horn on the top of the head and in others they have horns of hair over the forehead some twist it on fine wires so that it stands out in every direction like snakes while others braid it so that it falls down in little tails over the cheeks they tie cowrie shells feathers and other things into the hair and put it up in knots of all shapes some of the men shave their heads all over or in spots all are fond of jewelry both men and women wear bracelets and anklets of brass beads or shells the women often have heavy brass collars around their necks some have sticks or grass stems stuck through holes in their noses and ears and almost everyone wears a charm of some kind to keep off the evil spirits we spend much time in the villages along the banks of the congo there are thousands of them scattered through the great basin some containing but a few families and others large enough to be called cities the villages are much like those we have already seen in our travels being made up of round or square huts thatched with straw many of the huts have conical roofs and in some cases the roofs extend out over the front covering an open place where the people sit and smoke or sleep during the heat of the day and where in the evening they gossip and chat these people have dances every town has its musicians and they often sing and play into the night they live chiefly for the hour they get up about dawn and have breakfast then the women go to their work in the fields and the men start out to look up their bird snares and fish traps or they may have an elephant pit to keep track of they must also be on guard against hostile neighbors some may work at their trades and both women and men start out early to carry vegetables or goods to the nearest market at noon every one who is near enough home comes in for several hours rest and then goes back to work toward night they eat the second or chief meal of the day although they may take a snack or so between times the evenings are usually spent in chatting dancing or other amusements there are little black children everywhere we see them at their games the babies have rattles the girls play with rude dolls they sit on the ground and make mud pies and play at cooking and housekeeping even the small boys on the banks of the congo are good swimmers they learn also to fish to snare birds and to shoot with bows and arrows they gather round us as we go through the villages and wonder at our strange clothing at one place we let a boy hear our watch tick and he says the noise must come from an animal inside the case these people live simply their huts have but little furniture only the chiefs and the rich have beds the others sleep on the ground often using a wooden pillow this is a block hollowed out like a bow so that it fits under the neck rising the head from the ground and keeping the gorgeous headdress from mussing there is sometimes a fire hole in the centre of the hut the smoke of which keeps away the mosquitoes the cooking fires are often built outside and some houses have also cooking sheds in many of the villages we see what look like great barrels covered with grass they stand upon posts with thatched roofs above them those are granaries in which the corn and peanuts and other such things are stored until needed they are high up to be safe from the rats snakes and other vermin in other places the grain is stored in bags tied to the roof the largest house in the town usually belongs to the chief it may have smaller huts about it the homes of his wives and slaves and sometimes a pile of ivory tusks from elephants trapped by the natives in many villages there are mechanics and we learn that they make goods for sale one town is noted for its pottery another for its fish nets and a third for swords knives hoes and farm tools nearly every village has its blacksmith shop which is one of the busiest places in town the shop is an open shed with a thatched roof the bellows a rude box of wood and skin and the anvil a block of iron about as large as a paving brick these people smelt iron with charcoal and shape it with rude hammers the men are noted for trapping and fishing in some tribes they think it beneath them to till the ground for that is woman's work and so they spend most of their time in the chase 
or in making war upon their neighbors fighting is so common in the congo valley that almost every village has a fence of rude posts about it the posts are sharpened at the top so that it would be hard to climb over them they are set close and bound together with vines there is often a ditch outside the stockade the congo women have plenty of work they take care of the houses and do all the cooking they cultivate the gardens outside the towns and gather the corn and store it in the granaries in some places they are little more than slaves they are bought and sold and often cruelly treated in many parts of the congo slavery is common some of the faraway tribes are still cannibals when such tribes are at war they expect to feast on their captives and a not uncommon taunt to an enemy is the exclamation you shall rest in my stomach to-morrow many of the congo people have some idea of god but all are superstitious they fear witches and believe that their charms and images will work good or evil everybody supposes his happiness or misery depends largely upon his charm or fetish and he who is successful is thought to have a better fetish than others these ideas are now passing away missionaries are working in different parts of the congo basin and they tell us that many of the black boys and girls are becoming civilized moreover slavery and cannibalism are being put down by the foreign governments now when a man dies the people are not permitted to bury his wives and servants alive with him that he may have them in the next world as was the custom in the past the belgian government has already established schools where native children learn trades and are taught reading and writing we see school children frequently as we go up the valley and find that some of them even know a little geography they have learned that the earth is round their fathers thought it was flat and that the home of the white man was under the sea because the ships going away from the coast seemed to sink slowly down into the water and those coming in to rise up out of it for the masts were first seen and then the hulls the little black boys are now being taught that this is one of the best proofs that the earth is a globe end of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b trade and commerce of the congo during our voyage up the congo we observe its great value as a commercial highway it is the only road by which the products of this vast region can get out to the ocean and some large european trading companies have established factories and warehouses upon its banks goods are taken from these stations to all parts of the congo basin and the native produce brought back in many places this work is done by porters who carry the goods on their heads marching single file for days along the narrow african paths in others the goods are carried in native boats on the streams upon the congo and its chief tributaries steamers are always moving from station to station leaving foreign goods to be sent out and taking on cargoes for the railroad at stanley pool before that road was built everything had to be carried on the heads of men past the cataracts to the navigable river below now all goes by train to matadi where it is transshipped to the steamers of the lower congo or to the great ocean steamers which call at matadi and boma there are now steamship lines connecting the congo with antwerp hamburg rotterdam and liverpool and the foreign commerce is rapidly increasing it already amounts to many millions of dollars and when the interior is further opened up by railway it will be greater still the most valuable product which the congo now gives to the world is rubber after which come palm nuts and palm oil and ivory in the shape of elephant tusks other exports are peanuts and coffee and copal a gum that is used to make varnish tobacco is grown in all the native villages and it may become an important article of trade the congo rubber comes chiefly from vines while that of the amazon the best rubber of the world is from forest trees the vines are tapped or cut and the milk-like sap oozes out it is boiled in iron pans and made into great flat cakes for export in exchange for their products the natives take food 
bright colored cottons hardware arms and gunpowder we shall see these various things in the markets which are held once every four or eight days in almost all parts of the congo basin the african week is different from ours it has but four days and market day is considered the most important of all suppose we visit a market and see how the africans do business at home they are great traders and will go miles to buy or sell thousands of people are often to be found in one market some of whom have travelled days for the purpose we hear the din of the buying and selling long before we reach the market it is situated in a grove of shade trees out in the country there are hundreds of black men women and children scantily clad moving about under the branches some are sitting on the ground with pots and baskets before them others have their wares piled upon a carpet of leaves and still others have rude tents or shelters to keep off the sun some are bending over arranging their merchandise some are carrying it on their heads from place to place and some are going to and fro sampling the wares and buying goods to take home there are many women among the purchasers and not a few have babies tied to their backs or sitting astride their hips as african babies are usually carried how noisy it is the whole market seems to be shouting at once the people scold as they buy and the women fairly scream at each other those peddlers with goods on their heads are crying their wares that man over there is telling a story and the women about him are laughing see they have thrown back their heads and their white teeth show out against their dark faces step aside for that man with the sheep on his head you must not get angry if you are jostled here for these people do not consider it proper to quarrel on market days strolling about with our guide we make our way from one class of peddlers to another the market is so divided that each kind of merchandise has its own quarter here they are selling tobacco and cola nuts there peanuts and bananas while farther on are sweet potatoes manioc cabbages pumpkins and indian corn we fill our pockets with peanuts and each of us buys a stick of sugar-cane to eat as we move onward what are those round dumplings piled up on the ground they look like loaves of unbaked dough that is the chief bread of the congo it is made of manioc a root much like the sweet potato only larger the manioc is first mashed to a pulp and then soaked in running water for twenty-four hours to wash out a bitter acid contained in it after this the pulp is allowed to ferment and then is mixed into a stiff paste when cooked it is sliced up and fried in palm oil butter or peanut oil it now looks and tastes like sourdough it is very nutritious in one quarter of the market are the butchers with fresh meat and near them are live sheep and goats and also pigs chickens and ducks the fowls are kept in wicker cages and beside them are fresh eggs in finely plaited baskets the sheep are beautiful animals but i venture to say you never saw such sheep before they are covered with fine long hair is this not a strange country where the men women and children have wool on their heads and the sheep grow beautiful hair we buy spearheads and knives of native make from the blacksmiths who show us also collars and bracelets and anklets of brass some of the women about us wear brass collars each of which weighs many pounds they are welded on to their necks and have to be broken before they can be removed in another quarter we buy pieces of the native cloth made in the villages we notice also beautiful basket work fish traps and meal sieves nearby are women selling pottery made of red clay and a man who has some wooden pillows offers them to us at a low price but few foreign goods are sold in the market we are some distance back from the river and such things are rare and costly still there are bright colored cottons from england knives from germany and gunpowder from belgium here men are trading gay handkerchiefs and glass beads for india rubber and there they are trading brass rods for all sorts of native goods we observe that the business is largely a matter of barter and that no money passes the several articles are traded one for the other sometimes at a valuation of so many brass rods for each brass rods have for a long time been used as money in many parts of the congo basin different markets have different articles which pass as currency 
and goods and money vary in price according to the fashion and taste of the people in one village blue beads will buy more than white beads and in another the standard of value is red cotton handkerchiefs in some markets cowrie shells such as we saw along the niger are commonly used while still farther on bright colored calicoes needles and pins brass tacks or pieces of wire will buy what we want one of the most valuable things sold everywhere is salt in this market a pint cup is the wholesale salt measure and we are assured that a very little salt is a fair price for a slave boy or girl end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven of carpenter's geographical reader africa by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in the great african forest pygmies travelling on up the congo we enter the great african forest one of the largest and most terrible on earth it covers the whole region of the upper congo extending southward to the watershed of the zambezi northward to that of the nile and eastward almost to lakes tanganyika and victoria it is as big as eight states the size of ohio and is about forty times as large as massachusetts the region is so vast that we can hope to explore but a small part of it and we confine our tour to the river and to short excursions off into the woods only a small part of this forest has ever been trodden by white men when henry m stanley the famous explorer crossed africa he travelled through it and other explorers have visited parts here and there we can learn something of the nature of the forest as we move slowly along close to the banks of the congo the dense trees come right down to the river and extend out from it for hundreds of miles the trees are so thick and their branches so interwoven that they shut out the sun we can see inland but a few yards from the banks and when we go off into the midst of the forest we find it like twilight at noonday the trees are of all sizes some of them being almost two hundred feet high they are bound together with ropes and cables of vines which wind about them like snakes and hang down in long strings it is hot everywhere the breeze is shut out and a warm vapor rises from the moist ground many of the trees wear a thick coat of moss and some have orchids and other air plants hanging to them here is one which has been struck by lightning those saplings beside it have been broken down by an elephant herd which has crashed its way through on the opposite side of the path are trees with great balls of gum oozing out of holes which the birds have pecked the ground is covered with fallen branches and dead trees our feet sink into the decaying vegetation we soon grow weary and sit down to rest on the dead trunks which lie all about us we do not sit long the decayed wood is full of ants and other insects which attack every inch of bare skin biting us terribly we have to look out for the wasps overhead and we soon learn that the forest is alive with mosquitoes flies of all kinds and beetles and worms without number we examine our feet every night seeking for jiggers and at times the ants bite us so that our skin stings as though whipped by sharp nettles there are monkeys and squirrels there are wild pigs and buffaloes herds of elephants and bush antelopes wild cats and rats of immense size at night the air is alive with bats and in the daytime strange birds fly through the trees but what kind of people live in this great african forest there are many tribes much like those we saw in the lower parts of the valley and there are others so strange that if we did not see them ourselves we could hardly believe they exist have you ever heard of the pygmies they are a race of little people found in different parts of africa and especially in this great congo forest pygmy men and women are not larger than fourteen-year-old american children and the boys and girls of our age will not reach to our shoulders many of the women are under four feet in height and some are only a little more than three feet still they are well formed and look like other men and women some pygmy men have beards and many of the little women go about carrying their babies on their backs or astride their hips the pygmies are of different types 
some tribes have light brown skins with hair almost red while others are as black as our boots with black hair the black pygmies are usually the taller although they are not so good-looking as those of lighter color having heavy jaws deep-set eyes and flat noses the lighter ones have large round eyes round faces well-formed figures and small feet and hands with long slender fingers these people wear but little clothing the men have only a strip of cloth about the waist and the women a short petticoat of leaves or an apron of bark some pierce holes in their upper lips and put porcupine quills and the teeth of various animals in them the pygmies are in a low state of civilization and live more like beasts than men they seldom clear the land and have no farms or gardens they have little villages going out to hunt and trap and dig roots and other things for food their villages are usually not far away from the settlements of other tribes and in such localities the pygmies often steal corn tobacco and bananas from their neighbors if their thefts are not noticed they may come back and leave skins or ivory to pay for the food they have taken these villages are different in different tribes some of the little people live in caves others put up shelters to serve for a short time only and move about from place to place some tribes arrange their dwellings in a circle around a cleared space in which the chief's house stands and others build their huts in rows the ordinary hut is seldom more than four feet in height and four or five feet in diameter it is often made in oblong shape being formed of branches stuck into the ground and tied together at the top and then thatched with leaves or grass the doors are so low that the pygmies have to crawl in these little people sleep on the ground or on beds of leaves spread out inside the hut some of the huts have two doors one in front and one behind in order that their owners may escape when attacked most of the villages have pitfalls and poison sticks about them as a protection against their enemies the pygmies use poison spears and arrows and to scratch from one of these will often cause death they are skilful bowmen shooting arrows so fast that the first one will often not have fallen to the ground before the third has left the bow they are expert trappers and hunters they catch all kinds of birds and trap elephants in pits they shoot the eyes of the elephants with their little arrows blinding them and then follow them until they fall they hunt birds for their feathers and antelopes and monkeys for meat and skins the pygmies eat flesh of all sorts except that of man they are fond of monkeys rats birds and reptiles they eat snails white ants bee grubs and the larvae of certain beetles they roast their meat on the coals and smoke some of it to preserve it for future use the women usually do the cooking and the men hunt trap and fight the boys are always practicing with bows and arrows and as soon as they are old enough their fathers take them out and teach them to hunt the pygmies have no language of their own but usually talk more or less imperfectly the tongues of the neighboring tribes they are droll little bodies elfish and full of fun they are fond of singing and have drums made of sections of a hollow tree covered with skin they are intelligent and quick to learn but timid and afraid of all other tribes except their own they try to return kindnesses but are spiteful when ill-treated and will wait a long time to revenge themselves upon their enemies they remind us of the gnomes and sprites we read about in fairy stories pygmies somewhat like these are found in southern africa and also near the great lakes and in french equatorial africa some live in madagascar where they climb trees like monkeys and swing themselves from branch to branch they are also found in the andaman islands in the bay of bengal and in the philippines where they are known as negritos or little negroes End of chapter 37